I'd like to to welcome everyone to uh, this webinar in uh, in virtual roundtable, um, which is co-organized by the European Brain Council and FPA, the European Federation of the Pharma Industry and uh, and Associations, um, actually working together in the context of uh, of this project on rethinking Alzheimer's disease. Um, I'm the, your moderator of today. I'm Frédéric Destrebeck, the uh, executive director. Of, uh, of EBC, and I'm really thrilled to announce that we have uh, 475 participants registered. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, connections are on the increase and in counting. Uh, but also very interestingly, we have representation from all over the, the world. So um, I'm tempted to avoid using uh, either good morning or good afternoon. Uh, also because this uh, webinar is going to be recorded um, and everyone would be free to uh, watch it and re-watch it um, as they please. Um, so today we'd like to introduce to you um, this project, Rethinking Alzheimer's Disease, in the context of the production of a white paper um, that is going to be uh, presented uh, later on in the process uh, of a consultation. But I'd like to introduce, no, uh, without further ado, our host of today, and um, and I should say a friend and strong defender uh, of uh, of this issue, uh, MEP Sirpa Pietikainen. Uh, Sirpa, you're a, a member of the European Parliament, the European Parliament for uh, a certain number of years now, um, but also in the past you've been uh, minister in Finland, but also member of the Finnish Parliament since 1983. So your your political engagement uh, is actually a, a very long-standing one. Um, but I have read in your CV that you have a background in economics and uh, and business. So uh, so your insight on uh, on the issue um, would be very interesting under that angle. But also very importantly and primarily, I should say. Uh, by a long supporter of uh, of the cause uh, in Alzheimer's, so I'm really pleased to to give you the floor to open and welcome uh, participants today, Sepa. Thank you, <clears throat> and on my behalf, wholeheartedly welcome to join this uh, webinar about rethinking the Alzheimer's disease. Um, <clears throat> and indeed, I'm uh, a passionate. Well, speak on behalf of uh, memory disabled people and the new treatments and how um, the knowledge of the disease is increasing, plus the new cures are on, on the table uh, almost yearly. And indeed, uh, the reason for my interest uh, started over uh, 20 years ago when my mother um, got Alzheimer's. Now, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, she has passed away already. So <clears throat> my interest is uh, not so much personal, but a, a purely professional and sympathetic for all the people needing early diagnosis <clears throat> and the best treatment. As said, uh, Europe has had Alzheimer's program, as uh, most of you might know. And we have uh, uh, Alzheimer's Europe working for these courses. But all in all, what we are lacking is the up-to-date of Alzheimer's program, memory disabled program, uh, uh, sort of uh, the understanding of the whole variety of memory disabling diseases in one hand, and then on the other hand, uh, of other neurological conditions and diseases. And this needs to be prioritized. And uh, as you know very well, only the uh, already the figures speak in how behalf of this, knowing that uh, almost one third of the population beyond the age of uh, 68, 70 is going to get uh, memory disabling disease, means it is a humane issue it is also a cost issue and uh, it is a welfare uh, and welfare society service system issue. In those days, um, when I started with uh, this subject, it was thought that uh, actually the disease 
uh, starts uh, maybe a couple of years before the symptoms occur. And so we have planned the whole system on the basis of a late diagnosis and the treatment. And we have uh, based our system very much on the thinking that there is not a curative disease. Uh, I mean, curative uh, from a pharmaceutical uh, method, methods. But now the no, uh, newest information and research actually gives uh, quite a bleak of hope in various fields. The first field is that uh, indeed we could get a curative uh, treatment on Alzheimer's and in many other neurological uh, diseases. We need a lot of research and financial effort and cooperation with pharmaceutical companies in these questions. Maybe some of the treatments might be beyond the pharmaceutical area, uh, for example, using ultrasound or lasers, but uh, that is sort of the next step. And what is the most important step is that we know the risk by genes, but we know that the early onset of the disease starts already in, in around 30s, and then actually you are way too late to get any curative or preventive uh, uh, treatment when you had your first severe symptoms on the age of 65, uh, let's pick up a number. And this is the reason why we need to rethink the whole treatment of the Alzheimer's and other, other memory <coughs> disabling diseases. And this is a vast change in our societies. When you start uh, a diagnosing how you identify with gene and uh, genomes and other way, which are the real risk groups, how you are preparing your system of the early on treatment. And uh, actually then much more positive outlook also how people can stay, for example, in their work life or have very uh, effective uh, independent living at home. This is something we need to work together. There's no point of doing this only in Finland with about 5 million people. And as you know, in Asian area, we do have almost 4 billion, not million, but 4 billion people. And in Europe, we have uh, half a billion, less than 500 million people. So all the sense tells us this is a European question. We need a European program for this. We need a European effort on this. We need to have a European knowledge together. And uh, we need to create a European uh, model to support the global thinking and actually kick off the UN and WHO uh, to be better uh, in the global level on uh, early diagnosis, treatment, and support of independent living of people with memory disabling diseases. With these words, once again, uh, welcome. And now I'm turning myself uh, on, <clears throat> on ears and start uh, listening what you have to say on, on this very interesting event. Have a very interesting and inspiring event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sirpa. Uh, your words are, are more than encouraging, but also, um, are also uh, gearing us um, as a, as a community, as you rightly said, towards the the key uh, action uh, and the key policies that are uh, actually looming, in terms of uh, what the the policy agenda can offer as uh, as hooks, but also as a transformation points uh, for for all these uh, these ideas, and um, and I should say that a European model. Uh, and the European model of collaboration in particular is actually uh, a great to hear and um, and I would say is uh, is a great support uh, of our initiative. I, I would like now to to turn to our, uh, our second keynote of today, uh, providing us with uh, with a patient uh, testimony. Uh, so I'm turning to uh, Ellen Rochefort Brennan, who is the vice chair of the uh, Irish Dementia Working Group. 
um, and who has kindly uh, accepted to contribute to uh, to our event uh, today. So, Ellen, please, you have the floor. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Good morning from uh, Sligo in the northwest of Ireland, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today, highlighting the value of an early diagnosis from a patient perspective. Uh, I would like to set the scene for you by taking you on my journey of diagnosis uh, of the brain disease, Alzheimer's. Even though it was some time ago, the same issues apply today, unfortunately, in many countries. Somebody once said, memories are most precious possessions. And every day it's difficult to lose something special. And all of us lose something special. Those with us Alzheimer's lose something special. Every day we lose something special. My diagnosis, well, my symptoms, my feelings, I realized that something was wrong for a number of years. It, difficulty retaining um, information, my memory uh, was impaired uh, or appeared to be, and my intellectual disabilities were not functioning uh, to the full capacity. The greatest difficulty I experienced was slowed thinking. And I suppose it gave me the most problems, just uh, remembering something I had newly learned, uh, which brought with it lots and lots of confusion. Following a head injury in my mid fifties, I was told I may have had uh, I may have Alzheimer's. It took many more years visiting various consultants to be finally diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. I can only describe to you that it was total heartbreak for me and my family. At this stage, I had given up my employment as I found myself forgetting events at recent meetings, problems finding words, stopping mid sentence and forgetting names, which was not very appropriate as I worked in the disability sector. Following my diagnosis, uh, my GP was very supportive and, and he continues to be. However, there was nowhere to turn to, no pathway of care. I was under 65 and there are no supports as funding for people with dementia in Ireland comes from older person services. So I realized there's no 100%, I got on Dr. Google, I realized there's no 100% diagnosis and I also realized that there was no cure. So life was pretty depressing and I quickly realized my, my human rights were being violated. So I got involved in research through Trinity College Dublin on cognitive rehabilitative therapy. And this led me to the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland and the Irish Dementia Working Group, which were being newly formed. And there I met people just like myself, striving for equality of life and equality. My journey moved from one, of, uh, one about acceptance of my diagnosis on a personal level to a journey about rights and advocacy for all people with dementia in Ireland. It is a story of voice and a story of rights. For too long, our voices were not heard or listened to. Thankfully, that is changing, albeit slowly in some countries. Public patient involvement is now very much part of research projects. We have an authentic voice. We have the experiential knowledge from pre-diagnosis to end of life. The Alzheimer's Society of Ireland supported me and continue to get involved in research and policy, to advocate through media, present at conferences, and very importantly, get involved in political advocacy. This is important. Our lawmakers understand the illness and need as we need adequate funding. This led me to join the European Working Group of People with Dementia as the Irish Dementia Working Group representative. I'm very proud of the work of my colleagues on this working group and with my Irish colleagues on the amount of robust engagement we do in research. We rethink Alzheimer's every day. One particular piece of research with the European Working Group of Alzheimer's, of Alzheimer's Disease and Alzheimer's Disease and Detect just came to mind this morning, where we provided feedback about issues linked to the use of risk reduction programs. As I was preparing for today, I thought about the millions of people living with Alzheimer's in rural areas with no transport, people living alone with no support, people who cannot use technology or have sensory needs. People who live in a country where they do not speak the language, and we know today because of war that has happened far too often, they have lost their voice. And I'm going to say that again, they have lost their voice. As we rethink Alzheimer's, let's not forget them because we all have the power to support them to find it again. Many of them do not have the opportunity to get a diagnosis until it's too late or if ever. 
what all of us with Alzheimer's want firstly is uniformity in healthcare systems across Europe and the world. Language matters to us. Some cultures in Europe do not want to use the word Alzheimer's or in particular dementia because we're not demented. We just happen to have a brain disease mm -hmm. that is called Alzheimer's and that's enough of a label. As advocates, we work hard in making a public health priority. We raise awareness from health to education, especially with our young people. We lend their voice to in stigma. I am not stigmatized. My illness is misunderstood. It's time to say goodbye to stigma and put more effort into education of illness. We continue, of the illness, we continue to call for early detection as this will have enormous impact of the financial burden of health departments and as you can give much better quality of life to the person as they receive person-centered appropriate supports. I am a great believer in value-based healthcare and here is a perfect example of cutting costs. Timely diagnosis must be part of a strategy. Unfortunately for many, diagnosis is too late and the time the, by the time the person presents to the GP, sometimes through fear um, and, and sometimes through the thought of a, a, the daunting cognitive tests. On average, 15 minutes, the GP must assess if I have depression, if it's old age, cardio, cardiovascular issues, or a form of dementia. The cognitive of many mental tests, like the clock, well, what can I say to you? We all have good days and bad days. So it's to us, to be honest, we do not feel it's appropriate. It is so important that, person, that the person is referred to a neurologist, psychiatrist, uh, a geriatrician, or whomever is in the service they have in the country for a definitive diagnosis. These appointments can take months to get, and PET scans are taking months to get an appointment. And one thing people with Alzheimer's, like myself, do not have is time. Time, because Alzheimer's is the cancer of today. And so we need to call on all countries to do better, especially at the MCI stage, to, to enable early detection and timely, accurate and effective diagnosis. Yes, I know research on early detection is happening. But as I said earlier, we need uniformity. Personally, I can't wait for broad biobase markers together with cognitive assessment from GPs. This is, will be innovative and drastically cut the costs. And also, uh, we hope that we have a medicine that works at MCI stage. But I ask, are our countries ready? And I often ask this, are you ready financially? If both of these were rolled out tomorrow, I'm not convinced, and so are many of my colleagues, that countries are ready. Are GPs trained? Are they going to be paid appropriately? As a diagnosis will take more than 15 minutes. Of course, I very much welcome all the work being done on detection, diagnosis and pathways and at the pre-dementia stage. While biomarkers appear to be a way forward for detection, I have heard many researchers over the years who do not believe this for amyloid and tau pathology for people like me. We need to, for people like me, we need to ensure standardization that there is secure evidence of Alzheimer's disease pathology. We need to increase the number of specialists and ensure sufficient infrastructure for diagnosis. We know from research, current healthcare systems are still not adequately equipped to detect Alzheimer's. Hopefully targeted screening could be used to detect Alzheimer's. It's imperative healthcare systems seek adequate funding to ensure early detection of Alzheimer's. As an advocate, I will continue to create awareness of the risk factors. However, health clinicians um, and health departments and clinicians, our communities and service providers could drive a greater campaign on risk factors. In Ireland, we are lucky with the National Dementia Office run a campaign on the Stand Together. Many of us with the illness often say, if I knew then what I know now, could I have represented the disease? I have cardiovascular disease for over 30 years. Sadly, it caught up with me last year. I got a stroke. I've tried to keep the advice given to me for prevention of the advancement of that disease, which is pretty similar to the uh, um, advice that we're given for Alzheimer's. Don't smoke, be active, look out for depression, ensure I have good social contact. My late friend Dermot told me when, when I first met him that he went to the grocery store three times a day just to have a social contact. And that's important. I walk my dog every day and I can assure you I have a social contact because they all want to talk to the dog, whatever about me. 
I also read lots, as I'm still very interested in what's happening in the world. Today, sadly, I think, and I want you all to think at this moment, of our friends in Ukraine, our friends that will not be diagnosed, our friends that have already had the illness. Unfortunately, due to my short-term memory, I don't remember much of what I read because it goes into, as I call it, Alzheimer's land. I do great training. It gives me confidence, and we all need confidence. The term less education irritates people with the Alzheimer's, as some of the geniuses of the world did not make it to third level. Education is also about life experience. So maybe you could consider rephrasing in, fu in, in future papers. I would like to remind you all, as you rethink Alzheimer's today, that having a time timely diagnosis will be great. But please remember, we need the best possible psychosocial interventions, as this will enhance our lives and bring joy to our families and get people with Alzheimer's out of their homes. Many people are still in employment at the time of diagnosis. Employers need to be educated about the illness and how they can support people to work. When diagnosed at an early stage, it is not care the person needs, it's support to do the things they always did. Continue with their hobbies, their sport, or their community work for as long as they can with this illness. I often say to my farm and friends, yes, the magic pill is welcome, but you could also support a community project that will, enhance, that will get people with Alzheimer's out of their homes. And we need good communication at diagnosis. And that's really important how diagnosis is communicated to us. I know you're, many of you will be aware of the Alzheimer's Europe position, position paper on diagnosis. You know, we have the right to be informed of the diagnosis. While care should be taken of avoiding unnecessary anxiety and suffering, information about the diagnosis should not be withheld solely on the grounds that a person has dementia, memory problems and communication difficulties. And we need information when the diagnosis is disclosed about the general state of our health and the prognosis of its treatments possible and the potential risks and side effects. Uh, one of the things that I was not aware of was the side effects of the so-called uh, medicines that would stop my progression. I can only tell you I tried three out of four. And the last one, I had such hallucinations that I almost drove out on the road and, and, and killed somebody. So we need to be aware of all of those things. And, uh, and, and the doctor has the responsibility to tell us this. And in many cases, if people are advanced, we need, we need, we need it in writing. If we have difficulty taking in information, it should be possible to have a second meeting with the doctor, maybe bring along our, our family if we wish, or a friend. Um, when we're, we should be provided with contact details of who can help us, who is there to support me. As I said in the early days, there was nobody there to support me. So we need, we need to have a, a, a proper system in place. And you know, we, we also need to have our medical professionals to keep us updated. And one of the things that I found recently is that, of course, uh, if I have diabetes, it is marked on my file here in, here in Ireland. But if I have Alzheimer's, the GP is under no obligation to put it on my file. So when I present to a hospital, as not so long ago happened, they have no idea I have Alzheimer's. They have no idea of a pathway of care when sending me home. And I can tell you, I truly experienced that. So it's important. It's also important that I want to say this, and I say it over and over again, it is my human right to know. It is not any doctor's right to tell my family or my friends or whomever. It is his right to tell me, no matter how advanced I am, unless I have an assistant decision maker, somebody that helps me. So it's important that professionals remember that. Um, people who provide diagnosis, we always have the right to be informed and the right to choose if we want to have somebody with us. And so it's important that every person to be diagnosed or be provided with contact details. So I, again, I appeal to medical professionals to ensure that we, um, that we are diagnosed on a, on a timely basis. Um, and it's all about our rights, our right to know, our right to care. So uh, thank you for listening to me. As you all rethink Alzheimer's today, I hope I have said one thing to you that will influence um, your rethinking of the detection and diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Uh, of course, I cannot do this alone and neither can anybody else. We all need support. So I'm grateful to the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland for giving me support. And also 
uh, I want to thank Alzheimer's Europe, um, the World Health uh, Knowledge Exchange, Global Brain Health Institute, uh, Publication Involvement Ignite Ireland, uh, the network, and Alzheimer's Disease International, and the support of my, my, my true friend, Carmel Gagan, who supports me to travel and to, and to talk to others and many more organizations that give me the opportunity to participate in research. And, and, and like yourselves today, you know what? This just gives me a great quality of life, but it also gives me confidence. I never dreamed back in 2007, when I was told I may, may have Alzheimer's, that I would have the quality of life today. So let's work. Let's make 2023 the year for proper diagnosis and detection, especially at MCI stage. And I hope, I hope, and I hope that our uh, scientists will finally come up with that magic cure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, that was, the least I can say is this uh, was a very compelling testimony. And uh, actually, I, I can see in the chat um, how commended uh, your, your um uh, talk was and uh, thank you for for shedding light on this, helping us uh, drive this this awareness, but also uh, correct any potential misunderstanding with what you described your was your illness uh, rather than uh, uh, a anything else or, or rather than uh, with uh, with you personally. And we are quite pleased today to give the voice back uh, to you as a, as an advocate. And uh, thanks also for for commending on. Uh, on this joint effort um, that it is uh, ours today, but actually, which is uh, the journey on which we are uh, embarking to together, uh, so so to say. So um, uh, actually, Ellen, you you shed light on a number of things that uh, resonate uh, in our uh, in our paper. Um, I mean, just to to give a few a few uh, facts and figures, which is always. Difficult after personal testimony like uh, like yours, um, but you emphasized uh, the impact, and so did uh, Sir Papietikainen before you. Uh, I don't think I, I need to 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 repeat the numbers, and I certainly don't want these numbers to uh, overshadow uh, the contribution that you uh, that you just provided. Um, what was really striking to me uh, against what you just uh, shared with us. Um, was the call um, that you that you emphasized in terms of how to change and then uh, rethink the whole uh, management and uh, you really emphasized this holistic approach um, in dealing with Alzheimer's disease uh, as a whole. Um, so today, actually, I uh, would like to discuss uh, on the basis of uh, uh, on a contribution like uh, like Ellen's um, what. Um, uh, experts and key opinion leaders uh, have actually contributed to, to our study. Uh, but also we would like the, this event and this webinar to be um, uh, an opportunity for a collective exercise of consultation. Um, so I really encourage you and those who haven't done so yet uh, to hit on the chat and, uh, and the question and answer tool uh, in order to raise any comments you may have uh, on the discussion, but also uh, on the on the content of what you see on the screen, or uh, to comment on what uh, our panelists will uh, will actually uh, uh, contribute today, um, and actually this engagement has already started as uh, most of you already contributed to our to our survey online, and um, uh, connecting to to a point that Ellen was uh, was making earlier um, was the point of um, checking whether our systems were fit for purpose and ready um, and uh, and actually ad adequately equipped in order to detect early uh, Alzheimer's disease. And um, you you were all confirming uh, overwhelmingly uh, Ellen's point that uh, there is much to be done and much to be improved there. Um, our, our first panel is going to address um, with key experts, um, actions and the most urgent actions that would enable uh, this early detection. And uh, I'll be uh, happily passing the floor over uh, to this group to comment uh, these first elements of response that were contributed by, uh, by uh, you as participants so, uh, in terms of the need to improve uh, professional education, 
uh, to foster general awareness uh, to another point that uh, Ellen uh, was highlighting. Um, and um, we were also um, uh, quizzing you on the, uh, the actually uh, the need in terms of uh, um, improving the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Um, so enabling adoption, availability and access of biomarkers, but also ensuring sufficient infrastructure for diagnosis were two of the of the key points that were uh, highlighted on that occasion. A last question that is actually uh, up for discussion as well um, is um, whether targeted screening would be a way forward uh, for Alzheimer's. We have an overwhelming yes, but actually uh, what we probably ought to disambiguate here would be the conditions by which such a screening would be organized. So that's potentially a point uh, that could be addressed uh, later on in our discussion and we'd happily collect uh, any views in the chat as well. So I'm uh, happy and uh, uh, actually thrilled to give the floor now to my colleague, Laura Campo. Uh, Laura is um, uh, working with us on this project uh, on behalf of the FPA Alzheimer Working Group. And uh, Laura, you now have the floor uh, to introduce your panelist. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick. And uh, I'm very impressed uh, uh, by the testimonies uh, so far. And uh, <clears throat> and hopefully with this uh, panel, with the next panel, uh, we're going to be able to shed the light uh, on uh, some of the questions around uh, healthcare system readiness. Uh, um, and um, uh, I want to introduce, first of all, our panelists today. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Christian Steen Fredriksen. Uh, I think, uh, yes, if you can put a your video, fantastic. Um, hi, Christian. And uh, Christian is a consultant neurologist and director of the clinical trial unit at the Danish Dementia Research Center, Rix Hospitalet. And uh, Christian is also a uh, co-chair of the European Academy of Neurology Scientific Panel on Dementia um, and Cognitive Disorders. So welcome to you, uh, Christian. Then we have uh, uh, Maria Teresa Ferretti. Uh, Maria Teresa is a, a neurologist and, uh, uh, sorry, neuroscientist and uh, uh, neuroimmunologist and uh, expert uh, in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and gender medicine. And uh, since 2016, Maria Teresa is a co-founder and uh, uh, also um, uh, scientific director of the uh, Women Brain Project, uh, a nonprofit organization. And finally, but not least, uh, we have uh, um, Linus uh, Johnson, associate professor and uh, health economist uh, at the Karoniska Institute in Sweden. Um, his research uh, is uh, focused on uh, economic evaluation uh, of uh, diagnostic technologies uh, and treatments uh, of Alzheimer's disease and uh, other uh, neurodegenerative disorders. So welcome to you, um, Linus, uh, and welcome to the panel. And uh, Christian, since I started the uh, introductions with you, um, I wanted to start with you and kick off on uh, a first question as uh, one of the, uh, in, the um, uh, responses uh, of the audience of this uh, um, of this event uh, um, was uh, quite striking to me, which is uh, uh, about 95% of the responders uh, think uh, that uh, the current healthcare systems uh, uh, are not adequately uh, equipped uh, to detect and diagnose Alzheimer's disease today. Um, are you surprised by this uh, information and? Uh, uh, can you give us uh, your perspective on the current healthcare system preparedness, especially on the space of uh, detection and diagnosis, uh, which is what we are exploring right now, and why is it so important? Uh, oh, you're on mute. I'm not surprised at all, um, <laughs> uh, because that's also my, uh, my opinion. Uh, I think we're facing uh, two major changes in the coming years. First of all, we have an aging population that's going to lead to more patients developing uh, disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. And this is also going to be affecting the workforces. So the number of physicians and nurses and so forth that uh, will be available to diagnose uh, patients that uh, develop these brain disorders. And the second thing, was, which of course is a positive thing, is that we're looking into a future where I think we will have some uh, disease modifying therapies for Alzheimer's disease 
Um, and this is going to challenge us in terms of identifying those patients that will be eligible for, for the treatment. Of course, we, we are compelled to, to try and do that now that we have, now that we hopefully will have an effective treatment. Um, and we will also see, obviously, a lot of patients who are, uh, a lot of persons who are perhaps worried well or who have other conditions that are also going to seek diagnostic uh, evaluation. So we really have a lot of uh, things feeding into our diagnostic uh, pathway. And we need to change that. Uh, we need to change how we, uh, how we do diagnostics, I think. Um, we need to rethink uh, the collaboration between uh, primary care uh, physicians and specialists. Uh, we need to um, rethink how we do diagnostics. We need, I think we really need to sort of look at uh, in a fundamental way how we've been doing things and seeing how can we utilize um, innovative approaches because we need to be innovative. We need to uh, think about telemedicine. We need to be thinking about digital solutions, wearables, AI, um, text mining. Um, and we really need to, to integrate uh, research much more into this diagnostic pathway uh, so that uh, these are not uh, two separate uh, streams, because we need research and innovation to to ready our our um, diagnostic pathways for the future. Um, Thank you, Christian. Uh, can you can you um, just uh, to close the loop on the what are the uh, major gaps that you see right now to reach these uh, um, eventually these goals? Uh, can you shed a light on this? Uh? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of gaps, but one, one major gap is how we engage the primary care physicians. Um, uh, they are busy uh, as it is, uh, and they are of course caring for a multitude of patients with a multitude of different diseases. And there are a lot of diseases that need to be diagnosed early on. So I think we need to start there, educating uh, primary care physicians, uh, developing tools for them, uh, that will enable them to diagnose some patients uh, and identify those patients that need to be referred to specialized centers. I think that's the major gap uh, really at the present moment. Um, Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. And uh, Maria Teresa, uh, since uh, Christian was talking about uh, the importance of the uh, GP, I think uh, one other uh, information from uh, the uh, audience uh, survey was around uh, uh, you know, the importance uh, of uh, uh, detection and uh, creating, uh, um, you know, additional uh, or more education and awareness uh, around uh, detection. Uh, can you give us a little bit of insight on this? And uh, you've done a, a sex and gender uh, patient journey project, if I recall. Maybe there is some insight that you want to share from uh, that experience. That would be great. Absolutely happy to do that. Um, so it's, uh, I think we have to start from the fact that we estimated about 75% of dementia cases worldwide are actually not diagnosed. So this is really a huge problem. Uh, it's a problem of awareness and education and that's the result from the survey that also impressed me the most. Uh, now, why is that and how sex and gender could actually give us some hints and how could we leverage them to improve this? Uh, the underdiagnosis, of course, has multiple causes. I'm just going to mention a few that I think are important. First of all, stigma. Um, we have normalized the conversation about diseases. We can talk over a lunch with our family about diabetes and blood pressure, but nobody feels okay talking about cognitive impairments or dementia, right? Uh, so we have normalized the conversation about other health disorders, but when it comes to the brain, there is huge stigma. And when it's about cognition and your sense of self, then it becomes almost impossible to openly talk about it. Uh, and uh, um, there is this fear and uh, shame. Uh, so this is just not um, something we, we, we want to uh, openly uh, face. On the other hand, even um, in the general society, but even among healthcare professionals, so the, the GPs we were referring to before, there are some misconceptions and we have to face this. I mean, there is still, the vast majority, according to a survey that was done by Alzheimer's Disease International, even healthcare professionals think that cognitive impairments are a normal part of aging. So it's just normal with age to lose your, your cognition and at some point develop dementia. Of course, this is not the case, but a lot of people still think so, even healthcare professionals. 
So this means that even those patients or those individuals that will, you know, gather their courage and go and talk to their doctors, they might be dismissed because the doctors themselves do not think or are not prepared uh, to actually properly address uh, this component. And uh, this whole experience as a patient in a patient journey can be different for men and women. This is a very important point for the Women's Brain Project, of course. Mm. I mean, health uh, begins with human beings, individuals. Individuals are different. If you're a man or a woman, there are differences. And um, the, the assumption that a one-size-fits-all approach can work is actually, we have seen in medicine that uh, very often leads to, to mistakes. So the whole experience of patients is different for many women and we have run a patient pathway project um, with a new dedicated survey really to identify uh, differences between men and women. We have found a lot of interesting results, just to mention one, even though in general, it's a long journey, right? So patients have to change multiple doctors, take a while before deciding to go to the doctor and then change different specialists uh, before finally getting a diagnosis. This is even more complicated uh, for women. So we found that men, when they decide, they decide because they are convinced by a caregiver, which is a woman. So the key point is a woman sending the man to a doctor and they go straight to a neurologist or a specialist. Women take the long course. They, don't, they, they take a long time before convincing themselves. Only when their symptoms worsen, they really finally decide to go to the doctor and they go first to the GP and then to the neurologist, so a longer patient pathway. These are important things to consider to know if we want to provide uh, patient-centered um, uh, care and if we want to really provide the right treatment to the right person uh, at the right time. And, and Laura, allow me to say, because we, we're gonna be talking about blood-based biomarkers, it is not just the whole experience as a patient, but really from a scientific point of view, uh, the prognostic and diagnostic value of these biomarkers might be different uh, in, in men and women. So for me, um, in general, uh, the, what I see right now is that we are entering a phase where we can have early diagnosis uh, thanks to, to, to biomarkers, thanks to basically a precision medicine approach. Um, the diagnosis is not just clinical, but we can actually give the molecular cause of diagnosis. So that's, for me, it's great news. It's uh, what has been mentioned before by Helen that Alzheimer is the cancer of today. I mean, cancer has precision medicine. It has really improved the treatment of patients. We should do the same in Alzheimer and I think we're getting there. But let's not forget that the precision medicine approach has to be tailored, has to you know, consider multidimensional data, analyze all possible aspects and also consider sex and gender differences. And by leveraging them, we might actually make these tools and the early diagnosis even better. That's uh, that's my message of hope. Thank you, thank you, Maria Teresa. It's very true, um, and I see uh, questions coming uh, in the uh, in the chat. But uh, before uh, going to the um, to the to the question from the audience, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, what you said is very true around the uh, importance of raising awareness, uh, reducing stigma, and. Uh, um, you know, start uh, thinking uh, in terms of a personalized uh, uh, approach to uh, to treatment uh, for the future. Um, Linus, both, both Christian and, uh, and uh, uh, Maria Teresa have mentioned a number of gaps that they see uh, in uh, uh, the uh, healthcare system, uh, uh, for the healthcare system preparedness uh, today. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to ask uh, uh, to you um, your opinion uh, um, on uh, how this healthcare system should change to adapt of these new diagnostics that are mm -hmm. coming. Actually, the current gaps that we see in in the in the diagnostic path, but also for the few, giving a look to the future, and what kind of evidence do we need to provide to payers to make this change happen? Mm. Well, thank you, thank you, Laura. Thank you for having me. Um, so, if we start with um, the current gaps, as we heard here, there is a, uh, already today an underutilization of the diagnostic uh, techniques and services that we have available to today. Um, just a bit of a, a positive side that it, it is actually improving. We've been following this in the uh, in the Swedish dementia registry in Sweden. We've been looking at uh, tracking. Mm -hmm. The, the, the diagnostic process. And over the last 10 years, um, the share of patients who are given a 
unspecified dementia diagnosis versus a, a true etiological diagnosis like Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia, uh, that that proportion of getting this unspecified diagnosis has, has been reduced from about 50% down to about 20% today. So it's certainly going in the in the right direction. Um, we see an increasing use of, of um, specific biomarkers, although even in a country like, like Sweden, where we're very quite liberal in using lumbar puncture and these type of techniques, um, we still we would still need to do more. There's still patients who are not uh, uh, who, who don't get a specific diagnosis. Um, and um, we also see that uh, quite quite a big proportion of patients are diagnosed in primary care, uh, where, first of all, we're not tracking them in our registries, so we don't mm -hmm. know, actually, the, the accuracy of the diagnosis there. Um, and also, we know that the level of, of competence um, is sometimes high, but it can also, can also be varying in, in primary care. So that, that, is a, that is a concern. We don't know if it's the right patients for, in fact, being, being referred yeah. to special care or, or not. Uh, we also know that it, it is an issue that the um, the accuracy of of clinical diagnosis without the support of biomarkers is is quite low actually in, in Alzheimer's disease and and uh, we we need to see an increased use of of the biomarkers that we actually have um, now so it it is it is a bit of a challenge of course to 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 as a health economist try to show so what is what is then the value of an accurate a correct diagnosis I mean it's of course easier if you have a treatment, a disease modifying treatment, let's say, that requires you to have the correct diagnosis, then it's quite easy to talk about the, the value of, of, of an accurate diagnosis. Now, we haven't had that to date, um, so, but still without that, there are, there are a number of, of health economic studies that have looked at the value of a correct diagnosis and have shown that, well, the, the cost of the diagnostic process is still pretty small in relation to the overall disease course so over the lifetime of a patient and, and actually just a small a small uh, improvement in in care management can actually offset uh, additional costs in, in diagnostics so uh, i'd like to add one more thing to that to the, mm -hmm. to the value of diagnosis that is sometimes overlooked um, uh, we see a tremendous value of having accurate diagnosis at the population level so it, since we were able to follow patients in the large um, population-based registries in Sweden, actually having uh, correct diagnosis allows us to understand the disease much better. And I think we will never actually reach uh, to a cure of Alzheimer's disease if we don't start using the technologies we have to accurately diagnose the patients. We can actually research to understand the disease better at the population level. That's, that's a additional value of accurate diagnosis that I think is, is sometimes uh, overlooked. Um, Thank you, Linus. And this is uh, sorry to interrupt. This is this is very important, and I think I wanted to turn it to Kristen again on the, the point that you are making on the accuracy, on the importance of the accuracy of the diagnosis. Uh, and we have also seen uh, one of the information and uh, actually concern in the survey was talking about uh, the lack of infrastructure. Uh, can you comment uh, on uh, what it means? Uh, what does it take uh, uh, to um, to have the right in infrastructure? And what are these infrastructures that uh, eventually uh, countries will need to be uh, equipped with? Uh, and uh, either Linus uh, or Christian, please feel free to, um, or Maria Teresa, of course, uh, to jump in on this. Uh, well, I think that... Uh... It's important to 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 start with the fact that uh, I think there are quite uh, severe um, uh, differences across across regions and countries with regards to infrastructure and availability uh, of biomarkers. So so patients will not have the same opportunities to get an accurate diagnosis um, everywhere in let's say Europe and certainly globally. Um, I I think that um, uh, the main uh, infrastructure that is needed is, is access to, to scanners, uh, access to lumbar puncture, you know, the ability to perform lumbar puncture at the present moment, uh, and cognitive assessment by neuropsychologists. Um, and, and the second thing is uh, personnel that are equipped and educated to um, interpret these biomarkers, because uh, it's really a package. It's not enough to just perform the biomarkers. You need to be interpret. You need to be able to interpret this, and this is a highly specialized uh, um, function. That it would be completely unreasonable, for example, to expect primary care physicians to be able to do. And that also speaks to the fact that we should be careful 
uh, not to think about blood-based biomarkers as the end-all, be-all in terms of accurate uh, diagnosis within this field. Because just because we go from CSF to blood, to blood doesn't mean that these biomarkers are going to be easier um, to interpret. And at the present moment, what we're seeing are biomarkers that identify Alzheimer's disease. And I think we really have to be mindful of the fact that this only in quotations account for around 50% of those that have a dementia disorder. So we must not forget the other 50% in this equation. Um, and we also have to uh, be mindful of the fact that we do not understand the pathophysiology and uh, uh, in Alzheimer's disease and things like dual pathology, uh, what, what's, what, what role does this play? I mean, I, I, it's, it's, the story doesn't end with beta amyloid and tau, no matter if it's, if it's important proteins. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I may... Uh, of course, that, yes, uh, I was... Thank you. So, so I completely agree with, uh, with the points made by Chris. Just to emphasize even more that um, as we hopefully s soon will see the, the entrance of the new blood-based uh, biomarkers, um, of course, the likelihood is that they will be used in populations that are on the milder side um, and perhaps quite unselected, where the uh, the prevalence of amyloid pathology might actually be, be quite low. Um, so if you have a test with less than perfect specificity and you're using it in a, in a population with quite low prevalence of the condition you're looking for, the positive predictive value might actually be quite bad, actually. So, so it's really important, just underscoring Chris's point, that we we, we use these blood-based biomarkers not by themselves, but in conjunction with other um, ways of, of, of enriching the population. So specifically, that will be different uh, new more sensitive and accurate uh, ways to test cognitive function using digital tools, for example. I, I think those type of combinations of the new blood-based biomarkers with digital assessment will be absolutely necessary in order to have a, a diagnostic pathway that has reasonable uh, positive predictive value in the end. Otherwise, we will end up with um, a lot of healthy people with, with positive biomarkers that the healthcare system then will have to deal with. And then we have a big problem um, because then we have we have made people worried and we have to deal with it. We're in the only way really is then to do very sophisticated testing to try to exclude that they have the disease. And, and that, that's that's going to be a really big problem. So I think that seeing it as a package and actually developing the whole infrastructure uh, that goes from everywhere, who is actually coming into the diagnostic process and the various steps in there until actually you have a decision Hopefully, uh, in the end, we'll have a decision to actually offer treatment as, uh, as well as the end. So, absolutely, thank you, Linus. Linus, and uh, and I think you said something really true. I mean, uh, we have uh, blood-based biomarker biomarkers that, uh, for the near future, are probably building uh, a lot of hope. Uh, also, because this, in the long run, uh, will result in uh, a more uh, a broader uh, type of uh, access uh, to. Uh, diagnosis uh, uh, in uh, um, you know uh, compared to today um, my uh, you know what I wanted to um, frame uh, uh, just uh, for the last few minutes uh, before I jump to uh, some of the audience question is uh, um, it's true that the uh, biomarkers for the future will hold promise uh, uh, but we need to work now still to create that infrastructure uh, infrastructure with what is available today uh, to increase detection uh, uh, and uh, assessment of uh, uh, cognitive uh, complaints in primary care uh, as uh, uh, Christian was mentioning uh, potentially using the existing tools uh, um, and also uh, create a faster referral from GP to neurologist uh, I think uh, that's uh, something that I heard as well and uh, access and reimbursement uh, to the current uh, um, uh, uh, biomarkers, uh, as we were saying. So I think uh, there is still a lot to do, uh, but definitely um, a forward looking uh, as we move uh, uh, into a new era of diagnostic uh, um, experience uh, um, as we move on. Let me, um, let me go to some of the questions uh, um, as I read. Uh, um, in what way um, can we engage primary care on uh, NDD detection among uh, the plethora of disease uh, patients uh, who suffer from um, it without overwhelming uh, 
overwhelming at the PCP. Who wants to respond to this? Um, maybe Linus, I see you nodding. Maybe I can try. I think it's an excellent question. It's something we've been struggling yeah. with uh, a lot. And it's we have actually a, a research project that's ongoing in Sweden um, at the national level together with, so, so co-designed with the primary healthcare sector, uh, attacking exactly this question. So how can we introduce some type of screening program that will not overwhelm primary care physicians and that, that syncs with the way that they're currently working. Uh, and one thing that we are trying, one concept that we are trying is to look at how primary, primary care physicians currently work with cardiovascular uh, risk prevention. Because mm -hmm. as you know, there's a lot of overlap in terms of the risk factors of, of Alzheimer's disease and cardiovascular disease in, in general. Um, and it probably is, is, is an easier step uh, in primary care to add uh, a dementia screening program, Alzheimer's disease screening program to an existing uh, prevention uh, work package that's that's already there rather than trying to create something in parallel. Um, so that's a, that's a study we currently have ongoing to see if, if you add actually a um, uh, one of these blood-based biomarkers to, to an existing screening program for cardiovascular disease, whether that can be workable. Uh, and it also has the advantage of, of creating a kind of pre and pre enriched population with hopefully a bit higher risk as, as well. So I think you have to, mm -hmm. you have to kind of work with yeah. the primary care sector, looking at how they're currently working with, uh, with, of course, with prevention in general, which is a big part of the, the work of the program. Yeah. But another way, Thank like, you, like, yeah. if, if I may, I mean, um, of course, we might even get. Um, Creative. What I'm thinking right now is for women, because of course, as the Women's Brain Project, I, I have uh, you know a focus there. Um, but um, for instance, we could uh, think of including a cognitive screening uh, at the ear uh, visit that women do uh, by their uh, gynecologist. I mean, that's something that we know that especially in the perimenopause, menopause period, that's a window of vulnerability mm -hmm. for women to Alzheimer's disease. I don't think many gynecologists are prepared to discuss this with their patients. But it could be a way to, to use the resources that already exist, adding just a little bit of education and maybe a very quick screening tool like Linus was talking about. And that could go a long way because uh, this is a visit that most women do. And same thing with diabetologists and other specialists uh, for, for other diseases that are known to be risk factors for uh, Alzheimer's disease. Well, great. I see a lot of other questions. Uh, uh, they're very interesting uh, um, in the uh, in the chat. Uh, one uh, thing that, though, I wanted to close uh, this uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, panel and pass the word to um, to uh, Frederick uh, for the continuation of the session is actually your one ask, uh, your uh, call to action, so to speak. And uh, I would love to. Um, uh, close this uh, this panel with uh, each one of you offering uh, your call to action um, uh, to policymakers uh, uh, to uh, make this uh, uh, change uh, uh, and uh, prepare the healthcare system as we have been discussing. And the ask is actually to try to make your call to action as tangible as possible and try to understand who should be that one person and that one thing that you want to ask. Uh, do you want to start ladies first, uh, um, Maria <laughs> Teresa? For sure. So as a researcher myself and representing a research organization, uh, an advocacy organization, the Women's Brain Project, uh, for sure my call to action is to potentiate and increase resources, especially funding for research in the field of precision medicine. So this is really by the use of biomarkers early diagnosis is just the beginning a molecular diagnosis, but as we were saying before, we will need uh, multidimensional data, new ways to analyze this data, interpret them with predictive algorithms. So there is still a lot of uh, work that needs to be done from a research point of view. And I think we have a great opportunity to revolutionize uh, the Alzheimer's field, leveraging precision medicine and leveraging as well, uh, sex and gender differences, which will play a role there. Uh, and if I may, Laura, very quickly, more than a call to action is a wish that I have just to raise awareness mm. to everybody who's listening to us today that whenever we are talking about early detection of Alzheimer's disease and uh, early treatment, we are actually having a huge impact on gender equity. So all this discussion we're having today is not just for health and society at large, but will have a huge, um, again, a, a impact effect on gender equity because women are overwhelmingly affected by the disease as caregiver and patients. So when we're talking about early diagnosis and early treatment, we're talking about supporting 
millions of women uh, in the world supporting their, their work, their possibility to uh, contribute to the society. Uh, so all this has a dimension of uh, gender uh, equity and health equity that I, I would like everybody to be uh, aware of because it's very important. Well said. Uh, thank you, Maria Teresa. Uh, Christian, do you want to go next? Yes, um, I, I, would, I would say that um, in the past, we have seen that uh, national action plans on dementia have been vehicles for real change uh, that have mattered in the lives of patients. So I would urge uh, that uh, every country in the European Union has an action plan, but also that we need to expand these action plans to have much more focus on diagnosis. That's the entrance point to a lot of the care uh, that these that patients will benefit from and early diagnosis as well, as well as research. We need research and that needs to be incorporated into uh, the diagnostic pathway. It shouldn't be two separate streams. And then the last thing is that a uh, national action plan has much more impact if it's followed by funding. So that, that would be my call to politicians. Well said. Thank you, Christian. And uh, um, Linus, please. So I get the, the last word. Well, I, I, I would yeah. actually completely agree with Christian. Our national strategic plans, a comprehensive um, strategy for how to introduce both um, novel diagnostics and, and treatment. And it's very hard to pick out one thing. Those things have to go in, in tandem. Mm -hmm. um, I would pick out one more one more aspect here that really requires also collaboration across countries, and that is the need for, for follow-up. I mean, we, we, we will not learn how to utilize these new technologies only from clinical trials. Um, I mean, we, we will absolutely need to follow up patients who receive, in particular, these new disease-modifying therapies in, uh, in routine care, and this goes for diagnostic services as well. Uh, that require collaboration across countries. Some countries have better conditions than others for, for an infrastructure for following up patients. We need to share data, share the learnings about um, uh, how to best use these uh, these tools. And of course, every country then have to figure out what what works in their in their environment. Uh, but I think that type of collaboration around follow up studies for patients undergoing novel diagnostics and also receiving new new treatments will be absolutely essential. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much, Linus. And thank you to the uh, full panel. I hope uh, it was uh, um, uh, insightful for, uh, for the audience today. And uh, uh, hopefully we gave, uh, and you gave uh, and offered uh, food for thoughts for the next session. So I'll give the floor to you, Frederick. I look forward to hearing uh, uh, the continuation of the discussion. Thank you to all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. And uh, thank you very much to, to your panelists as well. I mean, I feel that we've got um, a full list of issues now to uh, to put to the attention of, uh, of our next panel. Uh, so we now have uh, a, a policy uh, panel made up of uh, actually two members of the European Parliament. Uh, we have uh, MEP Deirdre Kloon from uh, the uh, European People's Party and from Ireland, and MEP Tomislav Sokol from the EPP as well from Croatia joining us. Uh, welcome, Deirdre. Welcome, Tomislav. And uh, we are also privileged to have with us uh, Dr. Nirja Chodari from the uh, WHO and the Brain Health Unit in particular, as well as Dr. Andre Rees from the European Commission and uh, DG Santé. Um, so welcome to, to every one of you. And actually, uh, Deidre, I was eager to let uh, ladies first and ladies uh, start. Uh, I, I was eager to give you the floor um, in order maybe to reflect on some of the issues that, are, that were raised by our previous panel as a first contribution. And, uh, and hopefully we can gather as well comments uh, from the audience and, uh, and have a discussion. So over to you, Deirdre. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Frederick. And uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Hello <laughs> to everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been, it's really been really interesting, uh, the contribution so far. First of all, I'd like to say to thank you to Helen Rochford Brennan for being, I mean, I think patients, it's important that we would have a patient here mm -hmm. and somebody who's actually living with Alzheimer's and who has managed to um, do that very well. I know she's an inspiration, inspiration to all of us. And I've been very fortunate uh, to have engaged with her on a number of occasions over the last number of years. I was just looking there, she said 2007, 16 years. She has been 
living with her Alzheimer's and um, uh, as I say she's an inspiration and maybe if we keep somebody like Helen and her requests and her needs at the centre of all our discussions and then we probably will get it right for all those patients across Europe for their carers their families and for their medical me their medical carers as well I think that's important okay so wh what would I say in reacting to the last panel I mean I'm, I'm reminded as we're discussing and a lot of the words that the word collaboration came up um, the word of um, you know uh, working in increasing the spend on research is really important. And a lot of this discussion is obviously it's a very different disease, but it's similar to, to COVID and how Europe reacted by pulling together, uh, sharing information, purchasing vaccines, and indeed the beating cancer plan that we've had in the European Parliament or from the Commission. You know, the words collaboration, sharing information, early diagnosis, uh, all uh, and engaging with the health professionals well, helping them to understand what they could and should be dealing with and how they can identify the disease. That's that's so, so important. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a medical, but I'm somebody who understands really the value of the, of the early diagnosis and how it can benefit patients and the carers and indeed it improve their quality of life and those their families as well. So it's really, it's a very similar. And I, I really believe um, we can do a lot if we put the center um, center stage, if we put dem Alzheimer's, dementia center stage, uh, the detection and early diagnosis. Um, I mean, obviously, yeah, from a national level, absolutely to have an, an, a national at, at all at all areas, an action plan, a dementia strategy is, is so important. Um, we have one in Ireland as well. And I mean, it's a, focusing on areas, increasing awareness, which is, I think, Really, really important as it was mentioned there a number of times uh, how GPs general practitioners do need more than the 15 minutes initial uh, meeting and then when they come across such a complex array of um, of issues so how, how are they they need more awareness uh, and probably more time to do that because as been said like the diagnosis the initial diagnosis is, is, is so important to be able to do that early and um, uh, and then, then intervention can happen, an appropriate intervention, whatever that may be for the individual. And then um, and that, that, that then will lead to, should lead to uh, increased and enhanced community-based services if need be. And again, coordination and collaboration is then between those that are providing the care and those that are supporting families and supporting individuals and their health healthcare professions. So, and, and research, research is really important. I think that's a European level. Um, that's where the focus can be in, in supporting research, relevant research in, in this area. Um, I know it's, um, your, your last speaker, yeah, Mary Teresa has a call to action, certainly research, and in fact, all your speakers, Christian and, and Louis, have said, research is, is so important in this area. Um, so I think that's really where the role that the European Union can play a strong role in uh, supporting research in ensuring. Not not with a, a stick, but, but ensuring that all member states have a, a, a dementia strategy in place, a national dementia strategy. Because from, when you have the plan, then you can uh, provide and support uh, the, the patients. And if you don't have a plan, um, it's you're not not going anywhere. So, and with that, and, and obviously you have the plan, but you have to follow the plan with finances as well, with know-how. And uh, again, I'm using the words coordination and collaboration because we've seen in the whole healthcare area that you can do so much um, if you share share information and particularly benefit, I think, for the smaller member states where are, are those that haven't haven't had a, a strong healthcare system, haven't invested as much as they could have or would like to have at this point um, in, in supporting them. So uh, that would be my reaction to it. I think we, not that we know a lot, I don't want to say that, but I think there's been a similarity in all the contributions um, that we really need to just take that, have our plan and, and build on, on that. I think that's important rather than um, reinventing the wheel. I don't think we're going to do that, but I do think, I do think as well, like, I mean, the cure, obviously we're not going to forget about that. That's so important, but there's so much that we can do today in terms of diagnosis, early de detection, diagnosis, and putting care plans in place to support those individuals because everybody is different and one size uh, will not fit all. So I, I mean, I hope I'm not repeating myself. I, I'm not repeating, but I think you know it's it's clear. We know we need to know what we want to do, um, and that will be from part of the white paper as well. Will be included in that. De definitely, thank you very much, Deirdre. And actually, uh, it provides me with an opportunity to really emphasize the the collaborative effort and the consensus building effort 
um, that this white paper will actually represent. Um, I mean, we've invested a lot of work in in uh, in achieving that, and uh, you you heard from the experts before uh, before you speaking about all the issues and the array of issues that uh, actually surfaced uh, in in our consultation, and um, we are really appreciative uh, of uh, of your contribution. And, uh, and actually, uh, I'm now turning to to you, Tomislav, in order to to get your perspective uh, in in a similar manner about what you just heard, maybe what uh, Deirdre uh, is uh, has just said, but also. In view of uh, you know uh, Andre on behalf of the Commission speaking in a mo in a moment uh, or, or WHO, so feel free, you know, to um, uh, drop a, a soap on their way uh, and uh, and uh, have a glide towards this um, this discussion. Over to you, Tomislav. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me and organizing this because I think brain disorders are one of the major issues. One of the major health issues, which is not uh, talked about uh, so so often, so often, unlike, for instance, cancer or even cardiovascular diseases, etc. So it's important to raise to raise to raise awareness of this of this topic, and this is why these kinds of meetings and events are good. <clears throat> When you speak concretely about you, what you can do, I always like to, to, to be concrete. And I think it's important to distinguish between what you can do and what member states can do. Because you know that healthcare is primarily a national competence. So th things like health insurance, uh, organization of the systems, uh, things like that are part of the national competence. So what you can do, it can support national poli policies, but it cannot harmonize. So you cannot set some common standards and uh, provide the entire common funding from health on healthcare from the EU level. So most of this has to be done by member states themselves. However, I think we have a lot of instruments, both regulatory instruments and financial instruments to make uh, healthcare much, much better than it is now. And I think uh, when you speak about financial instruments, uh, the first thing is definitely investments in, investment into research. So research, uh, this, uh, this is something that has been mentioned also by the, but by the others as well. We have Horizon. Uh, program. We have now the new horizon, the new budgetary period, which has a much stronger healthcare focus than the previous one. And even in the previous one, we had more than 400 million euros invested into research on Alzheimer's disease, which so shows that this is considered something very important. But now with healthcare being one being much higher in general on the priority list of the new horizon, I think that these investments into research on brain disorders in general will, be, will become much, much stronger. Also, one thing which is very important, and I'm speaking from Croatian perspective, are enormous differences which exist between different member states in terms of equipment, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of number of specialists who can deal deal with certain topics, and, and on healthcare investments in general. So, so if you want to have a com similar standard of healthcare provision in all member states, it cannot be, it will never be the same. But to have it at least similar, we have to we have to reduce these differences. So we have to invest into health infrastructure, into health workforce. This is one of the major problems in, in the Eastern Europe that I come from, is the brain drain, the, the outflow of patients, of uh, medical professionals, not just doctors, uh, uh, but also nurses who, who go to live and work in, uh, in the Western Europe and Northern Europe because of better working conditions, better salaries, etc. So the so EU can do, really, can do a lot through cohesion policy and also through recovery and resilience. Plan can do really a lot to, really, to reduce use these differences to have much better infrastructure for healthcare treatment and also for Alzheimer's disease treatment but also and we can but also to invest in workforce for instance we in Croatia have been fi financing new specializations in uh, in areas where we have deficit of, of healthcare experts for years now from EU funds so this is also something which I think is very important and this can this this can really be used a lot so I think that uh, from the financial point of view, both uh, both investment into research, but also but also investment into into infrastructure, into the quality of healthcare systems, is something which is very 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 important, at least in some parts of the EU. When you speak of regulatory regulatory instruments that we have, I think pharma legislation is crucial. We know that because we cannot base everything on public research, so. So for public funds like Horizon, we can we can fund basic research, fundamental research. But if you want to have concrete patents for new treatments, for new medicines, etc., we have to stimulate also private research and investments. And this is a problem because uh, because of very rigid and very complicated regulatory 
framework and regulatory environment in Europe, a lot of these investments have gone to, to China, to the US, etc. So now we are waiting for the new proposal from the Commission on the revision of the pharma legislation, which should definitely, I believe, be, uh, be made in such a way that it really provides additional incentives for really innovative research. And to, which will, I believe have to distinguish between incentives for research for products and medicines and treatments which all, which only supplant the existing ones and really, really innovative ones. I think that if we want to stimulate new innovative uh, innovative, innovative research for new innovative medicines and uh, medicines and and treatments you really need to, need to provide additional incentives for the for those who invest in that i think this will be very important to strike this fine balance so to stimulate investments and research but also to make it to make it possible that medicines are available in different member states this is also one of the issues so medicines new medicines new products new treatments are very exp expensive especially those innovative ones and we definitely have to come up with common european policies to to make uh, to reduce to reduce these prices, but all but also to make this the, the new medicines and innovative treatments available in all member states, whether it be from uh, through joint procurement, uh, whether it be whether it be uh, uh, differential pricing, uh, taking into account the financial possibilities of different member states. So there are different possibilities on the table, but we will have to make sure that all European patients have access to innovative treatments also for brain disorders, which is very important. And one last point, and then I'll finish. I'm currently also working as a rapporteur on the European health data space. And if we want to have research innovation, then health data is crucial. And now we have the problem that health data cannot be used in many cases, cannot be exchanged between different member states, which hampers research and innovation. And this is something that needs to be tackled. The idea of European health data space is to make it possible to exchange data between different member states and to make it interoperable for both for primary use by medical professionals in different member states, but also for secondary use. And if we make it work, if we are able to to use this to facilitate the use of data for cross-border healthcare research innovation, then I believe that that we will have a big that we will have really big breakthroughs in terms of innovative new treatments which are offered offered to European citizens. So we I, so this is a very important file. I'm glad that I was appointed the co-rapporteur from the Envy Committee, Public Health Committee, on this. And I will do whatever I can to have this file and this regulation adopted by the end of this parliamentary term. And I believe that this will be something that will really stimulate research innovation in this field. Thank you, Tomislav, and thank you again for expressing your support in uh, um, uh, making sure that brain disorders are, uh, continue to be better prioritized the way the way they should be. And, uh, and obviously, uh, as to the point raised by uh, Deirdre, there are plenty of issues that uh, we are likely to come back to um, with your help and uh, in, in collaboration with you. But actually, the two of you raised uh, uh, quite a number of issues that I'm eager to let uh, Andre on behalf of, uh, of the Commission respond, um, because uh, obviously there are a lot of uh, legislative uh, uh, initiatives that are, are in the pipeline, but there are uh, actually quite a lot in the making, and we emphasize the need for further collaboration and coordination. So, Andre, turning to you and maybe also um, in your new capacity as special advisor, it's probably good uh, to uh, to benefit from you having a, a more overarching perspective on these developments. Um, but uh, Tomislav and Deirdre also pointed to the share between EU and national competences. So having been a negotiator, but also member of a, of a national ministry, uh, you probably also have... Uh, um, you know, uh, a good insight to provide uh, to provide us with uh, in the conversation today. So over to you, Andre. Thank you, Federica, and thank you for your invitation to this very interesting uh, event. Uh, first, I, I think I would like to refer to the to the expert panel discussion and the, and the, the white paper. What struck me, you know, was the, the the important area of the skills of of of, of, of uh, different health professionals and who is well or should be better trained and, and what kind of, of, of patients parts you know um, we, we can we can establish and this is really also echo from 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 Helen's uh, uh, testimony and and and, and 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 many others I think we, we really have to reflect this a little bit more because when you see this this chapter of your report you know it's it's you know you have uh, GP, okay, everybody knows GP has to do more, but you know how much time GP can allocate, and 
but I think the good question we should address, you know, what kind of tool we can we can provide to support this. And Christian mentioned the, the new world of digital uh, digital tools, which also to, uh, we discuss under under European data space how better utilize, you know, these digital uh, solutions and and. Uh, it's important that the, the tools we are giving, you know, directly to the, to the, to the patients, citizens, or those they, they start to feel uh, not well, and they, they, they are assessed and they, they are correctly uh, addressed to, the, to, to, to individuals, to caregivers, or to, to, to GPs or, or other specialists. But then we have the, this, this different type of specialists, you know, the psychiatrists, uh, neurologists, uh, geriatricians, and so on. Frankly speaking, if you if you would like to ask, you know, patients today, most probably you you you, you did this during this, this 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 exercise. This is really difficult to understand where 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 and how to turn to to this this different different materials. So my my first I think comment will be. Really, we have we have to go back to to, to different uh, doctor specialties, different uh, health authorities, and really reflect again. You know how to establish and make uh, a little bit more clear to to to, to those they need there are needs. You know where and when they they have to to go. Uh, the second point on, on regulatory um, and development. You know we we have now pipeline full of important uh, projects already uh, proposals on the table under negotiation like European data space. We have clinical trials uh, under implementations. In, in few days, there will be obligation also for uh, academia to, 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 to join the, the new, new, new system. So we hope you know, this, this implementation of clinical trials will help also to, to, to get also the harvest of the, of the an outcome of the different, different clinical trials, both sponsored by, by industry, but also uh, by academia. Because I think the, the only way to do it, you know, when we get more data and we can analyze better, is we know how much investment was done in this area during the last years in, in R&D, and, and, and still we, we would like to get much more as the, as the, as the, as the, as as those they, they they really believe the evidence based treatment or diagnosis should be better, but we still need more evidence. So so this 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 vicious cycle is is continue. I know that you know being different meetings, you know private and and, and industry sponsors, everybody has. has all kinds of questions, you know, where to invest, you know, where is the right or the right investment is should happen. So I think this is my second point. Really, we have to 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 find a way to 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 get for the for better investment. The area we we as a commission, but also industry, try to to define as a as a as a new area of work is um, through the prior public partnership, innovative medicine initiatives. You know, in in, in two two already. Uh, turns, but now we are in the even more interesting uh, journey with uh, both with digital industry and the medical devices industry, together with pharma industry. And we hope, you know, in this uh, partnership, we can look also for the for the for the for the for the solutions. And the last point is about the interdisciplinarity. I think the the, the this already mentioned this this new uh, public private partnership when we have three sectors of industry and and then public public uh, money research money but i think this is very important that we really have to 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 think you know who should be attracted you know to the research field but also to the to work with 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 those patients you know psychologists will be one example but also we need better trained nurses we need to understand better what are the this uh, all kinds of economic uh, uh, elements in the in the in this journey. So really, we need the, the, to bring as many disciplines as possible to this very complex, very complicated uh, journey and this in this very critical moment. As many many experts already said today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. Um, I mean, lots of uh, of uh, very interesting and. Uh, and it's insightful comments. Um, and uh, actually, being mindful of, uh, of time, I'd like to turn to, to Nija because we've got a psychiatrist in the room. I mean, you were making the point about the, the skill mix and the workforce and the most uh, uh, 
um, appropriate um, a medical doctor we should we should have in terms of uh, of expertise. Uh, Nija, you have a background as a psychiatrist, but uh, you you are now working at WHO in the brain health unit. Um, I mean, WHO was really active in the space of of mental health, but more recently. Um, with um, with the brain health uh, strategy and the, the global action plan in uh, in neurology, what is your insight on on the discussion of today, and how do you see uh, the discussions at the European Union level? Uh, how would that feed uh, into your work at WHO and uh, vice versa? Thanks a lot, Frederick, and thanks for having me on this panel. Um, I also want to echo Deirdre in giving a shout out to Helen. It's always a pleasure to be at the same uh, meeting as her and uh, learning from her insights, which are extremely valuable in the work we do in WHO and the Brain Health Unit, in fact. Um, a lot of what has been said in the previous panel and by my co-panelists in this panel actually resonates with how we think about um, uh, you know, the work that we're doing in dementia and specifically relating to uh, early detection and diagnosis. Um, if we were to, if I was to focus on three things that I've heard and what that would be important to support early detection, it would be um, primary health care. So we've heard about the importance of mainstreaming or integrating dementia diagnosis within primary health care. Uh, this would help the access of diagnosis to be easier. There would be a tiered approach where only the complicated cases then would be seen by the highly specialist services. And especially for the work we do in low and middle income countries, this is an important focus of our work. The second thing is to have a broader awareness and training of healthcare workers. We've seen this, we've heard this being repeated multiple times. Um, and it's not only healthcare workers, but also the general population. We need to also address the demand issues, uh, reduce help in reducing stigma so that people can access services uh, and able to offer services to where people actually go. Uh, the third important thing is uh, we've heard again this spoken about is the support and the resources and infrastructure for dementia diagnosis and accurate diagnosis. And this includes reliable tools and biomarkers to diagnose dementia, cognitive screening tools, which might not be accessible in some low and middle income countries, and also imaging facilities, which are scarce in some places. So the, our work in supporting detection and diagnosis is a priority in WHO. It's aligned with the Global Dementia Action Plan, as well as the recently endorsed Intersectoral Global Action Plan for Epilepsy and Other Neurological Disorders. In fact, the Dementia Action Plan um, has a specific global target for dementia diagnosis, and member states have, in fact, signed up to this which is having 50% of member states being able to have the dementia diagnosis rate of at least 50%. Um, and this, of course, is a global target, but then uh, countries can set their own uh, specific targets. In terms of supporting countries to um, for their response for dementia diagnosis, we have developed tools and we also support countries more directly, and, and, and that's the way in which we kind of uh, work together with member states. Um, let me give you some examples of tools. I'd like to highlight three specific ones here because they relate to the conversations that we've been having. One is the MHGAP uh, intervention guide with its associated training materials. Now, the MHGAP guide is... Um, basically based on evidence, uh, uh, on, on recent evidence. It provides non-specialist healthcare providers with very easy to understand algorithms to assess and diagnose and treat a range of mental, neurological, and substance use conditions. And amongst these is dementia. Um, so we have uh, recommendations for dementia diagnosis and treatment. We have um, training materials to train trainers as well as healthcare providers in the use of these materials. How would they assess people who present to uh, the settings, and including primary healthcare settings, in order to be able to detect uh, dementia? Um, more recently, uh, last year, uh, we uh, published the blueprint for dementia research. We've heard about the importance of research being repeated uh, uh, during this meeting. 
uh, and we, we we recognize this. We uh, what the dementia blueprint actually does is to support the prioritization of dementia research globally, but also to provide a coordination mechanism. So there's a generation of high quality uh, evidence. There's fast tracking of innovation, effective implementation, and knowledge translation, and also to guide funders into what areas and have a kind of coordinated funding uh, approach. Um, the blueprint itself has a specific uh, chapter on dementia diagnosis. So it identifies what the current gaps are, what actions are needed, and specific milestones, the milestones that we can achieve. I think there are four milestones within this chapter, but the milestones we need to achieve by 27, uh, 2027 and then 2030. Um, it addresses development of biomarkers, clinical assessment of cognition and functioning, as well as diagnosis during the prodromal stage, which is also extremely important when we're talking about early interventions. Uh, what we hope is that this blueprint actually provides a roadmap for a coordinated response. So uh, different stakeholders will find this blueprint useful in planning their research activities, uh, understanding you know, uh, the diseases causing dementia, and development of tools and resources for better diagnosis. As a part of this work, what we are also initiated work on is developing a, a what is called a PPC or a preferred product characteristics for dementia diagnosis, which focuses on fluid biomarkers. So basically what this PPC is, it's a planning tool for the development of health products. And we bring experts together to help us in the development of this PPC. It specifies what the intended use of the diagnostic product is, who the target population should be, and what the desired attributes of the products are. So what it does, it provides guidance to product development programs and the wider scientific community, as well as regulatory authorities, so to, to kind of have a coordinated public health approach. These are the tools that I've described. Um, what we also aim to do is to work directly with countries, uh, convene the uh, stakeholders who would be important for this piece of work, including people with lived experience and their families, including uh, low and middle income countries that help us to have better knowledge exchange and, uh, you know, an ensure uptake of evidence that is being generated. I think that's really important. Also to work with countries to detect, to identify what are these barriers to detection and diagnosis. So how can we identify specific country uh, barriers? We, what are the strategies we can, uh, we can identify for different stakeholders to take actions to address these barriers? And that will help improve the preparedness of health systems to take up these biomarkers and to be able to actually uh, use them for timely and accurate diagnosis. I think what we are hoping is that um, uh, the, we know that the, the global targets within the Dementia Action Plan are extremely um, uh, 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 challenging. We know that we are still racing to achieve those targets, but we are hoping that by 2025, we actually achieve the target of increasing the dementia diagnostic rate. Thanks a lot, and let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nirja. In the, actually, we are, we are hitting, or we have hit the... Um, uh, planned uh, end time of of our meeting, but uh, I see that there are plenty of uh, of issues that are that are thrown on the table, which is prompting probably a need to 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 carry on this discussion. I'm just eager to give a last word or last opportunity to comment because you you came up with a lot of uh, of issues from the, the the dementia action plan, and uh, I'd like to invite uh, every one of you for uh, I would say one takeaway message, uh, a very short one. Uh, ideally in, in something like 30 seconds, but I, I would say one takeaway under the format of a commitment uh, in terms of um, all the, um, you know, the needs that were expressed today, but also uh, the opportunities that we identify in terms of how these uh, should be uh, should be addressed uh, potentially. So uh, Deirdre, I'd like to, to start with you. Okay, thanks, Wendy. A quick one. Um, what, what, one comment I was, uh, which I've heard before, but seventy-five percent of cases go undiagnosed worldwide. So that's where we're starting from. But I think the point that Neera just made there about we need to identify the tools for a coordinated public health response, and if we have those and implement that, and make sure that they are in place in every member state at European level, 
but I think um, we will go towards a long way towards what we, what we want to do today is early detection and diagnosis. So, so that should be a, a priority, identify them and make sure from a European level we can do that there's a coordinated uh, response across member states. Thank you very much, Deirdre. Thank you. Thank you. I think when we speak about early detection, I think two. Uh, I think it's two things are crucial. So first is to really have comparable data from different member states so that we can have this coordinated approach. And this is something where EU can really do, do a lot. In health data spaces, I think the primary tool to do that. The second thing which. which which has been mentioned, I think that is also very, very important. That's the role of primary care. And the COVID-19 has shown us that many, in many member states, unfortunately, primary care has been really neglected in terms of funding, in terms of educating uh, healthcare professionals, providing them with specializations, uh, uh, providing them with good working conditions. And this is something where definitely we will have to do a lot. EU has provided a lot of funding also through as the financial instruments that I mentioned, but we really need stronger commitment both from the member states and also help from the EU to have primary health care uh, uh, reaching much higher level than, than it, it is now. And I think what we also need is a concrete strategy with concrete benchmarks and concrete concrete timelines. We want to really increase the, the quality of uh, primary health care provision in the EU. And this will definitely then I believe help also early, early diagnostics and, and detection of uh, of brain disorders. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samislav. Andre, over to you. Uh, you're on mute, Andre. We cannot hear your commitment. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think the commitment is already in the in the work program for you for health uh, 2000. Uh, uh, 23 so, so there is a also project for 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 in this in this field we should not also forget in other initiatives um, culture together member states define five areas of cooperation one of them is mental health uh, neurodegenerative disorders so i think it's also uh, somehow the bridge between member states and eu level and commitment to share practices to and i think we should use this instrument and finally uh, last week, we, we started the call for important initiative of this year, uh, mental health, when we also called for evidence. I think it's important since this also interlink um, to, to the well-being and mental health. So welcome. Bring more evidence, which can help us also to, to package this more wisely for this year. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. And uh, Nija, I'll let you uh, have the, the final word on the a commitment and takeaway from this panel. I think I'm really um, thrilled about the commitment that, that the member states are uh, are verbalizing. And I think um, the, I can speak for the Brain Health Unit and the Mental Health Department that we're committed to supporting member states in their actions to address the dementia challenge. We'll continue monitoring the targets towards both the action plans. We have the Global Dementia Observatory to kind of track how mm -hmm. member states are doing but also to kind of work together with member states to address barriers and challenges and think about how we can convene stakeholders together towards our common aims. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nirja. And please uh, convey our greetings to your colleagues uh, in, in Geneva within the unit and the directorate. Um, I'd like to, to thank our panelists. Uh, thank you very much for, for this discussion. Um, I mean, I'm just uh, sad that we have to, to bring it to a close because uh, there were so many issues um, that were touched upon that still ought to be to be addressed. But um, we actually look forward to being able to, to um, uh, move on and continuing this discussion uh, at, uh, at another uh, opportunity. Um, it's no time and I uh, would like to apologize for expanding a little bit beyond uh, the, the scheduled uh, end time, uh, but it's no time to uh, also conclude uh, this webinar. I'd like to, um, to thank all of you for uh, participating today, but also uh, for contributing comments uh, online and, uh, and actually via this QR code, we'd like to invite even further contributions and comments um, from each and every one of you. Because as I said in the beginning, uh, this exercise was very much to be seen as a consultation exercise. We'd like to make the recommendations of that white paper, uh, that white paper as robust as possible. Um, and this is uh, really thanks to, uh, to your contribution that we can, uh, that we can make it happen. Um, so this white paper will be circulated to um, 
uh, all of you as participants, but also will be released on uh, social media in the coming weeks. So stay tuned. And uh, uh, we look forward to uh, continuing this, this discussion, as I said. And I'd like to uh, thank all the team that is behind um, um, in the background and uh, in our situation room at EBC, um, but also uh, with our uh, colleagues at FPA uh, for helping us putting all of that uh, together and uh, making today's event a success. So thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. And uh, we look forward to being in touch. Thank you.